What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Josh's Hoarder Corner, and welcome to episode one of Constant Viewer, the Stephen King universe. Today, we're going to talk about Stephen King's first published work. Now, this wasn't the first book that he wrote. That would be, uh, let's see, there was Blaze, there was Rage, there was The Long Walk, and that would be released later on under the pseudonym Richard Bachman. But his first published work was actually Carrie. Now, he wrote Carrie on a portable typewriter while he was living with his wife Tabitha in a trailer. Things were not going well. He was struggling to make it as an author. He was ready to give up. He actually threw away the first three pages of Carrie and Tabitha found him in the trash can and was like, you need to continue with this. You cannot give up on this story. So this would go on to be released on April 5th, 1974. It would inspire the Sissy Spacek movie that had a sequel. It would inspire a TV adaptation, a musical, uh, a remake of the movie, and we're going to talk about each of those things. We're going to talk about some collectibles and toys that were released for it that are in my collection. We're going to talk about some music that was inspired by it, but we're going to kind of journey through the different things and elements of Carrie. The final piece that we'll show you is that flowchart that we mentioned in the pilot, if you saw that. The flowchart, I'm going to show you how Carrie can connect with a few other stories along the way, where it's mentioned in his other books, and how it fits into the Stephen King universe. This was the first introduction to him utilizing Maine as the home base for so many of his stories later on. Chamberlain, Maine was the home for where this occurred. I'm getting ahead of myself. <sighs> Take a deep breath. I am so excited to walk through this with you. This episode is sponsored by Tampax. Plug it up. Well, this is a strange camera angle that I'll probably never use again. It might work, who knows? But it doesn't matter. Behind me here, what you're gonna see is some art pieces done by Dave Quiggle. Dave Quiggle was a musician that was on Face Down Records with some of his bands, X Disciple X AD, Jesus Wept, among others. He does some awesome pop culture art nowadays that have these like crazy looks and feels to them. You see, we got Carrie here, just her face, nice dark there. Oh, that looks pretty good. We got this one here, her at the dance, half covered in blood, half before the blood was dropped on her, five gallons of pig's blood fell from the rafters, landed on top of Carrie. As far as toys and figures, I don't have too much to show. We do have this adorable little Lego Carrie lady from the remake of the movie. I believe it was the 2003 version. We have this figure here. On the back it says, a reimagining of the classic horror tale about Carrie White, a shy girl outcast by her peers and sheltered by her deeply religious mother who unleashes telekinetic terror on her small town after being pushed too far at her senior prom. This was a NECA, a NECA figure, real toys, licensed by MGM. So pretty cool figure. I got this from a collector's group here in my area. Uh, individual was selling it and I claimed it as quickly as possible. Now, obviously you can't say that Funko Pop is a lazy company. They're all over everything. So they've done a couple carry pieces. You know, this is not Carrie, but this is the man himself, Mr. Stephen King, with that nice blood over his head. This was a Barnes & Noble exclusive, uh, Funko Pop number 44, if that matters to you. But you'll see that it is almost that Carrie inspiration to it, where he has that blood dripping down on him. There was also the Walmart exclusive Carrie at the dance, ready to go, ready to get her boogie on. She's got her crown, Funko Pop 1143. And then finally, now this one kind of sucks. I received this in a mystery box at one point, but it is the classic Carrie look. She is covered in blood. But the downside to it is they put her in the box while she was still wet. So there's some paint on the case. Now, can you imagine having one of these pops signed by Sissy Spacek? Or the Stephen King one signed by Stephen King himself? That would be mind-blowing. Now, I would be a real jerk if I did not point out this piece right here was actually a gift to me from my good friend Mario. Mario is one of the nicest dudes you will ever encounter in your life. There's no arguing it. But he gifted this to me a while back. Uh, it was for Christmas, actually. Um, and so this is one of my favorite pieces in my collection, that Dave Quiggle carry art. I'm going to be real with you. What do I think is missing in the Stephen King carry toys? A Toonie Terror. A Carrie Toonie Terror would be amazing. NECA, make it happen. 
So you saw some toys. That's cool. Let's get back to the book. What are some things you need to understand about where Stephen King was at this time and some of the things about Carrie herself or where this character originated? So one thing to keep in mind throughout Stephen King's career, one thing that happens quite a bit is he gets criticized for his take on the female role or people of color, how he speaks on them without the experience or understanding of what it's like to walk in their shoes. Carrie really set the tone for some of those criticisms in the future because here he is writing from a woman's perspective about things that he himself never experienced. Menstruation, that having a period, that first fear of what's happening with my body. Now he relied heavily on Tabitha King to really lead him through those areas and really define who Carrie was and how this experience shaped her. There was some woman who said, you write about all these macho things, but you cannot write about women. And he responded, I'm not afraid of women. I'm not scared of women. I could write about them if I wanted to. So based on that, he got this idea. He wanted this, this incident that happens in the girl's locker room and the powers that are unlocked by that experience. So she's going to start her period. Other girls are going to be picking on her, making fun of her, throwing sanitary napkins at her. And that experience is going to release these hormones. And those hormones are going to trigger these powers. And all of a sudden, boom, Carrie is born. Now, this isn't the first, or this is the first time that he really has this strong female, but it's not the last time. I mean, we see Annie Wilkes, we see um, Firestarter, we see these other movies and these other books, and these other experiences that he writes about where he has this nice, strong female role. And it really all started with Carrie, with him challenging himself to write from that female perspective. And it may be flawed, and there may be times where he's wrong, but he's usually pretty quick to admit that and take accountability for those actions. He notes in his books, Dance Macabre, that one of the subtexts of Carrie is feminism. You know what I forgot to mention? When we talk about how Stephen King doesn't know how females mature and how their periods work and things like that, one thing that he can speak to is how high school bullying works and how that goes because he was a high schooler at one point but he was also a teacher. He worked in the schools. He saw it firsthand. He knew that kids could be terrible assholes to one another. Something to keep in mind. All right, so I know what you're thinking. Josh, you said so much, but you said so little. You showed us some toys. You talked about Stephen King not knowing how to write about women. But you haven't told us anything about the book specifically. I have. But let's tell you some more. I have a few resources here we're going to utilize. Right here. The Stephen King Universe, a little bit of an encyclopedia by Stanley Weider, Christopher Golden, and Hank Wagner. This is going to come in really handy with this series. I also have the book. So I'm going to read you a little bit about the book. We'll just go with the jacket sleeve here and what it says. This is a novel about the other world in this world. It is the chilling story of a girl and her strange power. Carrie White could produce motion and objects without contact or other physical means. This little known phenomenon known as telekinesis is produced in individuals under circumstances of extreme psychic stress. And Carrie was indeed pushed beyond human limits as she unleashed her frightening power upon a small New England town. Stephen King's story will stun your sensibilities, jangle your nerve endings, and make you wonder even more. Carrie by Stephen King. Now, I mentioned how this was one of the first stories that he featured in Maine. Now, you don't really hear much more about the town because if you read the book, I'm not going to give away too many spoilers in this, but it's hard for anything else to happen to the town. Big goal in this series is to avoid spoilers. It's going to be hard, but it's a goal. The Inner Jacket reads, Carrie was the odd one at school, the one whose reflexes were always off in games, whose clothes never really fit who never got the point of a joke, and so she became the joke, the brunt of teenage cruelties that puzzled her as much as they wounded her. There was hardly any comfort in playing her private game because like so many others in Carrie's life, it was sinful, or so her mother said. Carrie could make things move by concentrating on them, by willing them to move. Small things, like marbles, would start dancing. Or a candle would fall, a door would lock. This was her game, her power, her sin. Firmly repressed like everything else about Carrie. One act of kindness, as spontaneous as the vicious jokes of her classmates, offered Carrie a new look at herself. That night of the senior prom, but another of Carrie's cruelty, 
forever changed things and turned her clandestine game into a weapon of horror and destruction. She made a lighted candle fall, and she locked the doors. In this, his first novel, Stephen King reveals a New England town, a girl, and a secret older than history. King's most recent novels are The Tommyknockers, It, The Eyes of the Dragon, and Misery. He and his wife, the novelist Tabitha King, live in Bangor, Maine with their three children. So what are some things you hear about this? When you read that jacket, when you hear about what he's saying about Carrie as a person, what are some thoughts that you have? To me, it brings up Arnie and Christine, how he was that underdog, yet somehow he became this misunderstood, misguided terror. He was kind of, I don't want to say a victim, but he became this person because he sheltered himself for so long, just like Carrie, sheltered herself for so long against all these attacks and all this being picked on. And finally, it just exploded. Funny thing is, Stephen King's birthday is September 21st. Carrie's birthday is September 21st, 1963. So there's that nice little link. Uh, just again, this was his first publication, but it wasn't his first venture into writing. So this sets a tone and sets an expectation, but it's also written a lot differently than some of his other future works would be. It's a series of reports, it's official documents, it is testimonials, and things like that that really tell this story and give it that unique spin. Is it a Cinderella tale? That's one thing that I came across, and it was really interesting to me. I'd never heard that before. But if you think about it, you have Carrie, the Cinderella of the story. You have the evil stepsisters, which would be like the girls picking on her in the locker room and the girls terrorizing her at school. You have the evil stepmother. Her mother was... One of the main things that held her back and limited her and, and really sheltered her from the world. You have Prince Charming, which was Tommy. And you have that godmother, which was uh, Susan Snell, who gave up her boyfriend, Tommy, to allow Carrie to have that date to the prom. Susan Snell was one of the evil stepsisters, if you will, at one point, but eventually she tried to be a better person, tried to be the bigger person. And even though it all unfolded the way it did, she tried. So she gets that fairy godmother role, if you will. These quiet outsiders that strike back. That's a common theme throughout the Stephen King universe. And it started here with Carrie, this, his first publication, getting that terrorized girl in her reaction to that terror, being so scared in that locker room and not knowing what's going on with her body and having these girls just pelt these sanitary napkins and torment her and terrorize her. She doesn't know who to turn to. She can't turn to her mother. Her mother's just going to make it worse because now she's evil. She's evil incarnate. And just seeing how it all unfolds. The amazing thing is Sue Snell, this isn't her first appearance in the Carrie universe. Now, Rage 2, or Carrie 2, the Rage, or Rage 2, Carrie, however you want to call it, that came out much later, uh, but it did kind of continue the journey of Miss Snell. Uh, she went from being a student to being a, uh, she worked for the school, she was a guidance counselor, and she worked with a relative of Carrie's. Let's go ahead and talk about the movies, shall we? All right, movie adaptations. It's bound to happen, we know. We have the original Carrie movie, we have Rage Carrie 2, we have a TV adaptation, we have the remake in 2013, all these different things. Starting with this original here, Carrie, the breakthrough film for director Brian De Palma from The Untouchables. He knew what he was doing in, in directing. He was a good choice. This searing supernatural thriller is based on the best-selling novel by Stephen King. At the center of the terror is Sissy Spacek, and a mesmerizing Oscar-nominated performance as a tortured teen with a secret inner life and secret powers to match. Carrie also features the film debut of John Travolta, Amy Irving, and Nancy Allen, as well as Oscar-nominated return of Piper Laurie to the screen. Spacek plays Carrie, a high school misfit who must endure continual torture and harassment from her classmates, a religious fanatic mother, and mysterious powers of telekinesis that she doesn't understand. So this was award-winning in 1976 for actress and supporting actress, uh, just some details about the film. It is originally released November 3rd, 1976, 96 minute runtime. 
It has grossed $25,886,000 or somewhere thereabouts. Uh, Safe City Space Egg, John Travolta, they used five gallons of pig's blood, and then the two Oscar nominations. Now, the sequel, The Rage, Carrie 2, that came out in 1999. It was 105 minutes. It was not a great movie. Uh, it was released March 12, 1999, and it made about $17 million. It was directed by Kat Shea, and it starred Emily Bergel. Berg? I don't know how to say her name. I apologize. But the plot follows uh, a young half-sister of Carrie White. So Carrie White's half-sister has these strange powers as well. And who is her guidance counselor? Sue Snell. So it ties it back to that original in that way as well. There was a 2 hour and 12 minutes TV film version of it in November 4th, 2022. That was directed by David Carson. And then in 2013, there was the remake, which wasn't too terrible. I will admit it's been a while since I've seen it, but it wasn't too terrible. Uh, it was 99 minute runtime. $84.8 million is what it made. Directed by Kimberly Pierce and starring Chloe Grace Moretz and Juliana Moore. So there is all that. Uh, there was also a musical. Now the musical was said to be the most expensive flop in Broadway history. Carry the musical. I would have seen it. The soundtrack for it or the track for it, I don't know how you call it, the musical, is available on Spotify. So you can check that out there. Um, in this book here, Stephen King at the movies, it does go through and discuss uh, some of the different movie, well, all the different movie adaptations except for the made-for-TV. Carrie 2013, The Pitch. A third go-round for poor Carrie White, fully prom queen, and psychic Avenger. Carrie 2002, uh, it does include the TV version. A retelling of the terrifying revenge of telekinetic high school outcast Carrie White. The Rage, Carrie 2 from 1999. This affected foster kid Rachel Lang discovers she has telekinetic powers. And then the original, 1976, Sissy Spacek, John Travolta, Carrie. A high school wallflower develops deadly telekinetic powers. Obviously, the movie is going to differ quite a bit from the book. Each version of the movie is going to differ quite a bit from the book. And then you get to the rage where it's like, we'll include some old characters, but don't expect it to be like the book. So there is that. I would love to hear your thoughts on the movie and some of those uh, different experiences that you've had with either reading the book or watching the movies, things like that. Tell me all about it down there in the comments below. Um, Another thing that I really wanted to point out is some of the inspiration. There's been like the art that I showed you from Dave Quigley. There's also been some songs and kind of retelling of the story of Carrie through music, aside from the terrible musical. So some of the lyrics to a certain song that I want to share with you, and this uh, shout out to our good friend Darren Duncan, the cool kid collector. Uh, I had written some notes down last night to include in this, and he... Uh, supported this decision, and I'm very proud of that. Had I not thought this, he would have made me so happy with with uh, pointing this out to me to include it. But I love that he called it out and gave me the inspiration I needed to include it. This is Ice Nine Kills, every trick in the book. One of their earlier albums, Ice Nine Kills, is like a metalcore band that incorporates a lot of uh, horror-themed elements to their music. So they do a lot of different songs based on different books or different scary stories. And in this album here, we had Hell in the Hallways. Hell in the Hallways is a musical version of Carrie. Um, so it says in here, when happily ever after came crashing from the rafters, she knew she wasn't meant to wear their crooked crown, but look who's laughing now. Sick. Check out this song again, Hell in the Hallways, Ice Nine Kills, Every Trick in the Book, Darren Duncan, the cool kid collector, thank you so much, dude, for making sure that I did not forget to include this. Get that out of the way. So we talked about the book. We talked about the movie versions. We talked about Stephen King writing from perspectives that he himself may not understand. But this was an amazing starting point in someone's career. Like, this set a tone. It set a path. And even though this wouldn't be the same approach to the readings that you do with Stephen King in the future, it set that tone and expectation and really 
started him off on the right foot in his career. Now people would know his name. The book itself, when it was released, they... Let's uh, see here. So the total sales count is more than 4 million. The sales started slow, but the paperback really pushed it out there. So when it first came out, they were really worried. Maybe it wasn't going to be the story they thought it was. Maybe it wasn't going to be the, sec the success that they thought it was. But once that paperback version hit shelves, it took off. It skyrocketed. And now it's one of his known stories. You can't say Stephen King without somebody mentioning Carrie. This one really set the stage for what was to come in his career. So we've talked toys, we've talked inspiration, we've talked books, we've talked movies. How does it all connect to the Stephen King universe? Let's break out the Stephen King flowchart by Tessie Girl and take a look and see where Carrie fits in. So Carrie is going to be right here. You'll see that it was released in 1974. We got a little flag off of here, telekinetic. Ties us to Carrie White herself. Now as we follow this down, all the way down here, we're going to see, doesn't want to be like Carrie at the prom, was a quote from another story said by Dinky Earnshaw, who was a breaker in the Dark Tower. So here we have one of the breakers for the Dark Tower that knows who Carrie is, knows that she exists, and doesn't want to be like her. Coming back up here to Carrie, we have this second one coming off here from Chamberlain, where Carrie is set, Ray Brower. Ray Brower from The Body, from Stand By Me. Ray Brower was the boy by... How about we just wait till we get to that? But that one is really exciting to me. You see that he is from the same town as Carrie. That town wiped off the map. We got a third one here. This one says, mentions the prom night fire. It's going to take us all the way over here to that one right there, which is the dead zone. The Dead Zone, 1979, you know you have um, some telekinetic powers in that one as well, but it just shows how it all ties together. Because Ka is a wheel, as Stephen King says. There are many levels of the tower, it's another favorite term that we get to throw out there in the Stephen King universe. But these things tie together. I hope that you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed putting it together for you. This is just episode one, speaking on Carrie. One of the first, well, the first, not one of, but the first publicized work of Stephen King. Join me next time when we talk about the next one down the way. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what the second one is? What's going to happen next? If we look up here, we're going to see Salem's Lot. I'm very excited to talk about that one. It was my dad's favorite, and it's going to be a great story. All right, so you know what? I decided, hindsight, I do want to close off on a different note here. This book is 199 pages long. It's not that long. I mentioned in the beginning how Tabitha King saved this from destruction. She pulled it out of the trash and she convinced Stephen to keep writing. This book is dedicated to her. It says in the front, this is for Tabby, who got me into it and then bailed me out of it. Tabby has been by his side through thick and thin, and I admire and respect that relationship that they share. Blows my mind how a couple can really stay together, work together, and evolve together. If you're going to go on the journey through the Stephen King universe, this has got to be a stop along the way. If you're going to do it, start with it. I highly recommend reading his books in publication order. Hopefully, what this, this series of videos does is kind of does that for you. We're going to explore all of them in order and hopefully tie everything together. I hate saying this, but I'm going to. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Leave me some comments. I cannot wait until we get in here for part two. Until next time.